Thank you, Derek. <coughs> well, I really want to thank uh, Derek and Catherine and uh, Gloria for inviting me, even though Gloria didn't show up yet anyway, but uh, I appreciate that. And uh, I also, I, uh, I appreciate the, just the fact that there is an ethical society here. I think I'm going to mention in my, my talk that I'm, uh, or you may have seen it in my bio material, that I'm originally from St. Louis. And uh, no doubt some of you may be aware that uh, there's a, like a huge ethical society in St. Louis. They've got a, a, a large structure, a large uh, membership. They're very well funded, very active in the community. And uh, I was, uh, uh, had a lot of contact with our ethical society in, in St. Louis. I was heavily involved in our local free thought organization. And uh, actually there was a very good working relationship between the Ethical Society in St. Louis and our, and our Free Thought group. A lot of the, the members of the, the Free Thought organization also belong to the, the Ethical Society there and we, we coordinated activities and uh, had a, a very uh, mutually beneficial relationship. Uh, the Ethical Society there was headed by a gentleman named Jeff Hornbeck for a number of years. He was a uh, person who was really uh, very active also on the international scene, the International Ethical Union. Uh, interesting character. I, uh, matter of fact, I remember reading back in the uh, late 1980s a book by um, this uh, r religious conservative uh, writer, the guy that does the, you know, the, the uh, what's that series of books that uh, taken away or left behind, right? And he wrote a rather, you know, uh, highly politically and uh, inflamed book about uh, about the threat of secularist during the uh, I guess this book was probably published in the 1970s late 70s and uh, he mentioned uh, good old Jeff Hornbeck in the book and made it sound like the guy ought to have horns or something but he was really a quite quite a great sweet guy you know but uh, yeah if you ever happen to you know swing through St. Louis you might want to uh, just uh, check out the the really sweet arrangement they've got there and what they've done with their ethicals. We used to have a Bible study group there that, that, that met, you know, which was really an interesting, you know, atheist take on the Bible that we had going. So it was uh, interesting to, uh, to have the opportunity to share your ideas, your thoughts on, on the Bible with a, a bunch of uh, people with similar alternative views of uh, what that book is really about. But anyway, the, the, uh, I'm going to talk today about Hubert Henry Harrison, who was uh, uh, one of the, uh, a person that was born uh, in the latter part of the 19th century, but uh, had uh, a major influence, and I think an under, underappreciated influence on, on certain uh, areas of thought in the uh, early part of the 20th century, and I think we're really still feeling the reverberations of uh, his influence even, even today. Uh, I think the timing worked out really well for this, actually, because uh, there have been a few things on people's minds lately that, uh, regarding the American attitude toward, uh, toward race that uh, I'll probably touch upon in my talk. This happens every once in a while when you have incidents like Rodney King or the OJ trial, and it, it kind of forces people to notice that there are a few, I guess you could say, unresolved issues in our society. Uh, lately, we've had... Uh, 
uh, the situation in uh, New Orleans where there are a lot of poor people were disproportionately affected by the tragedy down there, a lot of them black. Uh, then you had this incredible statement by their former education czar, William Bennett, that uh, certainly deserves some reflection upon. I'm assuming everybody's aware of what. Uh, William Bennett uh, made, well, he, he made this statement to the effect uh, that, uh, you know, in the course of some discussion of, of crime, he said that uh, the uh, cr crime rate could be reduced if we were to ab abort every black child. And uh, he said that uh, he never really apologized for saying it. He kind of came back and explained that, well, this is a thought experiment, you know, that really he didn't really propose. He did say that they could, you know, that they could do that, but it would be terribly wrong, ter terribly immoral to do such a thing. And uh, I, I mean, uh, many people were dismayed by by that statement, if, even if it was a, a thought experiment, it's, it's kind of interesting to analyze what type of mentality would give rise to, to such a, such a proposal. He was in office? No, this was just recently. Yeah, he's, a, he's not really the, he's a freelance pinhead at this point, you know, he's no longer employed by the, but uh, he still has very close relation, relationship with the, the current administration and has been very well respected. Yes, I'm sorry. I heard the entire radio program when he was telling when this happened, and the original discussion was about the decline in crime rate in the United States, and it can be tracked to the advent or the beginning of uh, abortion when abortions became legal. Ever about 20 years later, when these big unwanted babies would have been um, old enough to commit crimes, the crime rate is down. So that's what they were talking about. And then out of nowhere, he brings in the board to black babies. It was just like out of nowhere in context. Yeah, I, I mean, well, I guess you could say, I mean, he, apparently he felt that his statement was, you know, factually correct. And I, I'm not going to argue that you can, you know, reduce the effects of oppression by committing genocide against the victims of oppression. I, I guess that would work in a sense. So, uh, I got to hear where he was trying to explain what you were saying. He was trying to say it was just a thought experiment, and it was shocking that there was a complete lack of empathy for understanding why what he said was even wrong. You know, well, I wasn't actually suggesting that. Of course, you weren't. You know, yeah. it was it was just it's like like a different planet. Yeah, I, I I never was clear on when he said it was wrong whether he thought it was wrong because he was so vehemently opposed to abortion or whether he was wrong because of the, the genocidal aspects of it, you know. The, the, but anyway, that's, uh, it's almost impossible to, to really get inside people's heads like that and figure out what's going on. But I, I think if you trace back through the history, at least you can see what uh, some of the genesis of that is. And I'll, I'll be kind of touching on some of those things as we go along here. Uh, but, you know, it all brings to mind just, the, you know, the, the kind of trite saying that the more things change, the more they stay the same, really. And it uh, seems like we've been here before. Maybe we never, never left. And that's when I think it might be valuable sometimes to revisit the analyses of, uh, of past generations. Uh, there's some wisdom, I think, there that we can still gather that might enlighten the, the current uh, predicament we find ourselves in. And one of the best social commentators about these types of issues in the first half of the 20th century was uh, Hubert Henry Harrison, who also happened to be an African American and who also happened to be an atheist. Mention of, his, mention of him isn't really found in uh, any history books. He's not listed in Gordon Stein's monumental encyclopedia of unbelief. I tried to find one of the, on the, one of the small books he wrote uh, a few years back. I guess this was like right around maybe 1990 or so when I first got interested, or a transcript of his uh, speeches. I couldn't find anything in St. Louis, any, any, uh, anything in any library. Uh, I'd never heard of Harrison, actually, until uh, you know, about that time. Uh, but you can't really count that against him because uh, the fact is, he was like many talented uh, African Americans, largely unappreciated. Uh, certainly, uh, not so much of his time, but later, as, as his historians recorded history and, re, re, and uh, put their spin on it, he was largely left out. Uh, 
I got a lot of information about Harris, Harrison from a brief article, uh, actually, in a book about um, African American humanists. Uh, I think his obscurity is, is in part due to his race, but there are other factors as well. He was, he was uh, not just an African American free thinker, he was also an immigrant, he was an ardent socialist, and a committed labor organizer. He was a member of an oppressed minority within yet another socially and economically oppressed minority. Seven and a half decades after his death, now few people have ever heard of Hubert Henry Harrison, but his uh, influence is largely, is, is still with us largely due to his contributions he made to the development of uh, modern thought on race and culture. And I'm going to try to retrace a little bit of that for you. The title I might have given for my talk actually is uh, Hubert Henry Harrison and the Formation of the Multicultural Perspective. Harrison was born in St. Croix in 1883. He arrived in uh, North America after, only after taking a uh, world tour as a cabin boy at age 16. He landed in uh, New York, he was about 17 or 18, and found a number of odd jobs as like, uh, you know, a porter, uh, elevator operator, and things like that. But during his off hours, he was spending his time profitably ex educating himself and attending night school. His academic skills and knowledge of foreign language uh, enabled him to get a, a job as, in the postal service. Now, you know, many of you may be aware that uh, postal jobs really were uh, very uh, popular among black people before those jobs became more lucrative. Actually, it was almost, you know, uh, like Pullman porters, the, the postal workers in many parts of the country were uh, largely black. This job, although it was probably stifling in his routine, did allow Harrison to continue his uh, self-education. But uh, eventually he had managed to get himself in trouble since he was kind of a, uh, a rabble-rouser type guy. He, uh, he wrote an article that was critical of, of Booker T. Washington. Uh, and at that time you have to understand what, what the politics were, uh, you know, among uh, people that were involved in the the civil rights movement, uh, struggle for black uh, equality. Booker T. Washington kind of represented the establishment position, and uh, many black people were critical of Bush Booker T. Washington. There was a kind of a continuum of Booker T. Washington on one end, uh, W. D. B. Du Bois toward the other end, but there were p still people that were more, even more, you could say, radical than, than Du Bois. But anyway, uh, his uh, critis harsh criticism of Booker T. Washington in, in the article that he wrote led to his uh, discharge from his job at the post office. But by that time, he was, uh, he'd already been working in, in other fields. He developed talents actually in, in, in the law and, uh, and especially in uh, labor organizing and public oratory. About this time, Harrison began to express his views concerning the socioeconomic factors in defining race relations. Harrison was dissatisfied with the view that African Americans were merely victims of the blind racial prejudice, and which uh, somehow it came into existence and was perpetuated as a natural byproduct of human nature. He didn't buy that. Harrison sought to use the history and economics he studied to explain the phenomenon of the oppression of black people. The conventional view was that blacks were the, the victims of oppression because they were either bad, which is to say at least inferior, or alternatively, that they were just somehow mistakenly perceived that way. The former view, that blacks were inherently bad, was at, was at that time, and maybe still today, uh, pretty popular. The latter view, that blacks weren't really bad, but just appeared to be to whites, and that this misperception was the root of racism, seemed to be the view that black people in the liberal white establishment had at the time. Consequently, the leading black figures of the day uh, by and large preached an undisputable display of virtue and industry, and they, they thought that that would eventually convince the white populace that blacks were indeed worthy of equality. But such a view incorporated a concession to the underlying feeling that maybe, maybe blacks were somehow inferior and had to really work harder to achieve the same as whites didn't really address the root cause of the negative effect of identifying or, or identifying a source, didn't really identify a source or motivation for the racism. The extra toil that this kind of hat in hand approach to improving relationship, uh, racial relationships demanded could easily uh, be interpreted as some type of penance that black people had to, had to endure. <clears throat> 
In any event, Harrison realized it would be difficult for blacks to work even more arduously than they already had. And for, as for moral rectitude, how could the victims of oppression ever be viewed as less virtuous than their oppressors? Such a scheme for attainment of justice seemed to be more likely a, former, a formula for further exploitation of black talent and labor, and even more efficient opp oppression of African American descent. Harrison's interpretation of relations, race relations was couched in his study of history, sociology, and economics. His break with the black establishment to define, or at least help define, a comprehensive historical, scientific, and philosophical context for black self-identity was perhaps his most valuable contribution. He did not view the oppression of blacks as somehow inherent in the white race. He realized that blacks had, when the opportunity presented itself, exploited whites in the same manner and even other blacks. The current patterns of racial discrimination were only a manifestation of contemporary systems of exploitation of one group by another. The larger pattern of exploitation transcended racial and geographic boundaries and underlay many of the problems of both modern and ancient societies. Not only race, but religion, nationalistic, or even or almost any distinction between groups was used to uh, excuse uh, uh, as an excuse to launch campaigns of exploitation. Arguing against the significance of race itself as the ultimate cause of discrimination was parallel between the position, uh, created a parallel between the position of blacks in the USA and that of other oppressed minorities in countries where race was not a factor. And I think this was the area in which a lot of times uh, the government sometimes became concerned about the uh, the civil rights movement and what that had, the implications that had for uh, international relations, but that's another story. Economic exploitation was really the key. As, as was repeated a half century later, the civil rights struggle could more accurately be viewed as a, a class struggle rather than in racial terms. Harrison's explanation of racial conflict and oppression in economic terms offered a more practical solution than the model constructed around theories of un, unexplained racial enmity that just kind of came about naturally. One of the results of Harrison's study of American social and racial problems was an appreciation for the approach taken by socialists. Consistent with socialist philosophy, which obviously influenced Harris's theory on, Harrison's theory on race, the Socialist Party initially took progressive stands on racial and other social issues. They were also strident in their presentation of their views, which kind of suited Harrison's style to a T. Harrison became extremely involved with the socialist and labor movement, working with the likes of Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, Bill Haywood, and uh, Morris Hilquit. Harrison became an organizer with the Industrial Workers of the World, the IWW, soon after it was formed in 1905, and that, in that capacity he earned the nickname the Hellraiser of the Wobblies. He's also been called the father of Harlem radicalism. During this time, Harrison supported the labor movement and str with strikes and even the, uh, the labor, he supported the labor movement strikes and even when the rights of black uh, workers were largely rejected by the uh, white workforce. Harrison felt that by attacking the overall problem of oppression of workers, he was also working toward a solution of the problem that divided black and white workers. Like many other socialists of the period, Harrison had strong feelings concerning the exploitation of other countries as well, and wrote and spoke in support of Indian and Chinese nationalism, as well as Irish home rule. Now, the, the problem of uh, racism within the uh, labor movement was, of course, something that Harrison had to struggle with, not always successfully. At one point, actually, he made the, uh, when he rejected uh, black people's participation in one particular uh, settlement because it wasn't fair, uh, the settlement proposed by the labor union, he said that uh, unlike Lincoln, his objective was not to save the union, but to free the slaves. As an intellectual, Harrison impressed virtually everybody he came into contact with. He studied and appreciated the works of thinkers such as Marx, Spencer, Schopenhauer, Lenin, Dewey, and Bertrand Russell. Harrison's knowledge of language included the ability to read Hebrew, Greek, Latin, and Arabic, which served him well in his biblical studies. Although Harrison attended night school at times, he was largely self-educated, but his self-education was such that he became a lecturer for the New York City Board of Education, speaking at NYU, Columbia, and City College. 
Working without notes, unlike me, Harrison routinely quoted long passages from his favorites such as Darwin and Huxley. In typical absent-minded professor style, he often forgot the names of people around him, though. Harrison was a strong advocate of Darwinism. This was at a time when Darwinian theory was being adapted by many racists to support their views concerning what was widely termed in both popular and, and scholarly literature and journals as the, quote, uh, higher and lower races. Harrison's views of Darwin's theories, however, were not focused merely on the current socioeconomic or geopolitical positioning of the races. Rather, Harrison viewed Darwin as from the security of a deeper, more meaningful understanding of the African heritage. Even certain learned white scholars appreciated this fact. Harrison's contemporary, renowned freethinker Joseph McCabe, uh, wrote, quote, primitive man was a colored person. 4,000 years ago, when civilization was already 2,000 years old, white men were just a bunch of semi-savages on the outskirts of the civilized world. If there had been anthropologists in Egypt, Crete, or in Babylon, they might have pronounced the white race obviously inferior and might have discoursed learnedly on the superior germplasm of colored folk. Of course, we know enough now to understand that any reference to early man as colored or white is really meaningless in relation to uh, our current use of those terms. Yet the placement of non-white people in an important position in human prehistory is, is an important admission from a sociological perspective of the time. Harrison understood that widespread ignorance of history and science was locked together with race, racial prejudice to form kind of a mutually reinforcing block against improved race relations. Racism could be best attacked by educating the people, but educating concerning black history was stymied by racist and inflexible institutions, including, of course, the churches. The best tool for attacking this bulwark against progress was good science. From this position, Harrison, if you will pardon the expression, preached Darwinism despite the strong protests of churchmen and occasionally violent objections of their followers. Of course, evolution wasn't the only thing about, which, uh, about Harrison to which believers objected. His views on birth control religion in, and religion in general earned Harrison a reputation as a persona non grata in religious circles, which no doubt had certain career-limiting repercussions, as uh, Bertrand Russell would later find out a, a couple of decades later in that same city of New York. Harrison made no efforts to tone down his views on religion in his well-attended lectures. He readily recognized the connection between religion and racism and pointed this out quite bluntly. The Bible was a slave master's book in Harrison's eyes. He noted the Bible not only sanctioned the keeping of slaves, but provided advice on their handling. He felt that any black person that accepted Christianity was either ignorant or crazy. He observed that he'd rather go not to heaven if it, rather not go to heaven if it was operated under the Jim Crow system, and noted that only, the only non-white spirit commonly depicted was Satan, speculating they would probably be in better company in hell. Such candor frequently provoked violence at Harrison's lectures, a fact that seemed to only enhance his standing as an influential and popular speaker. Harrison's style of speaking was not overly scholarly or erudite. He sought to explain complex propositions in a manner that could be readily understood by just, you know, by his diverse audience. Harrison in the teens and 1920s frequently spoke on New York City street corners and parks. One day he might speak before a small crowd on Lenox Avenue in Harlem, and then perhaps later in the week address hundreds at 99th Street and Broadway. On September 22, 1922, Harrison lectured before an audience estimated at 11,000 from the steps of the U.S. Treasury across from the Stock Exchange. The New York Times reported the next day, Hubert Harrison, an eloquent and forceful speaker, broke all records at the stock exchange yesterday. Topics included such subjects as philosophy, history, economics, and of course religion. Harrison had a caustic style as well as his, as well as his iconic, <coughs> pardon me, Harrison had a caustic style which as well as his iconoclastic approach to the most sensitive topics seemed to attract hecklers. Harrison took on one of these antagonists with enthusiasm and a quick wit. John Jackson, another early admirer of Harrison, and a notable freethinker in his own right, retold the story of a young man who ridiculed Harrison with a spurious question, to which Harrison responded in kind. The young man objected, saying he was not to be made a fool of, since he was highly ed educated and just, had just finished Harvard. Harrison responded that the man could not have finished Harvard because it was still there in fine condition. <laughs> 
Harrison put paid to the incident by joking that students graduate, uh, graduate on, what he call, on what they call commencement day, asking the Harvard man why he decided to finish on commencement day. The crowd responded with laughter and applause. Harrison fre frequently seemed to merciless in his derision, in the derision we pile on ideas of his intellectual ad adversaries. His style was to use a, a sarcasm and humor to make his points, which, which often stirred somewhat understandably intense resentment from the targets of his attack. But Harrison enjoyed the verbal give and take after which he was always ready with a smile and a hand extended in friendship to his most recent victim. Despite Harrison's superb oratorical skills, the instrument, of Harrison's the instrument of Harrison's influence was primarily his writing more than his speaking. In Harlem, Harrison founded the Liberty League, intended as a radical alternative to the kind of milquetoast NAACP, and published that organization's newspaper, The Voice. Actually, I have a little uh, piece here from The Voice I'd like to read to you. This is from uh, uh, the 25th of July, 1918. Is written by Hubert uh, Harrison. The essence of the present situation lies in the fact that people whom our white masters have recognized as our leaders without taking the trouble to consult us, and those who by our own selection have actually obtained to leadership among us are being reevaluated re and in most cases rejected. The most striking instance from the latter class is W.E.B. Du Bois, the editor of The Crisis. Du Bois' case is the more significant because his former service to his race has been a, of undoubtedly high and courageous sort. Dr. Du Bois first palpably sinned in his editorial closed ranks, but this offense lies in a single sentence. Let us, while this war lasts, forget our special grievances and close our ranks. That's the quote from Dr. Du Bois. It is felt by all critics that Du Bois, of all Negroes, knows best that our special grievances by which the War Department bulletin describes as justifiable, consists of lynchings, segregation, and disenfranch disenfranchisement, and that the Negroes of America can, cannot preserve either their lives, their manhood, or their vote, which is their political lives and liberty, with, with these things in existence. So there was a, a lot of uh, political tension at the time among uh, the black community relative to their approach to uh, uh, the white establishment, particularly in this case, they're referring to, to World War I and the uh, urging of, uh, of the, uh, the black, uh, cons more conservative black uh, groups such as the NAACP to close ranks behind the, the country, behind the, uh, the, the, uh, the war effort, despite the fact that there were things such as uh, lynchings and uh, segregation actually in the in the army and the other government institutions. This comes after, of course, the fact that the W.E.B. E. Du Bois and other uh, cons more conservative blacks had urged uh, blacks to vote for Wilson in, uh, in his election. And then they had been insulted when once L Wilson came into office, he actually reversed many of the recent advances that blacks made and replaced many of the, uh, the, the uh, positions held by blacks in in government with with whites, so they're very. Uh, this actually strengthened the position of people to the left of Du Bois, such as Harrison, and they found their voice in uh, a number of organizations and and uh, publications such such as uh, the Voice, this this newspaper. Harrison also contributed articles to periodicals such as the Call, the Modern Quarterly, and the Truth Seeker. Now, some of you may be uh, familiar with the Truth Seeker, actually. The Truth Seeker, many years before that journal briefly fell into the hands of racists, featured Harrison on the cover of his 50th anniversary in 1923. That issue contained a description by editor George MacDonald of what was, from some accounts, a rather typical Harrison speaking engagement. Harrison addressed an, an open-air meeting and argued in favor of birth control while attacking churches for promoting superstition and ignorance. Suddenly from the crowd, a man brandishing a crowbar advanced at Harrison. Harrison was short but well built and wrestled the crowbar away from his assailant and chased him out of the meeting only, be to, only to be arrested himself by police who frequently attended his uh, lectures at the urging of churchmen. The episode ended on an up note, however, when the magistrate dismissed the charges against Harrison. They probably didn't know he was an attorney when they arrested him. Harrison achieved considerable success as a writer at a young age. By age 24, Harrison contributed book, contributed book reviews to the New York Times. In 
He also wrote articles and reviews for the New York Sun and the Tribune magazine and, uh, and the Tribune and magazines such as The Nation and The New Republic. For four years, he was assistant editor of Mass of Masses magazine and also editor for Marcus Garvey's Negro World. During this period, Harrison continued to give lectures attacking the veracity of the Bible and exposing religious swindles, both spiritual and material. Ironically, this led to a sincere offer to teach at a theo theological seminary in Tennessee. In fact, Tennis with Harrison's knowledge of uh, Hebrew, Greek, Latin, and Arabic, he was an extremely able scholar in many areas and an expert on the Bible. Whether he would have been willing or able to suppress his free thought inclinations as a teacher of theology is highly questionable. But Harrison did seriously consider the offer before deciding to stay with uh, Marcus Garvey. Garvey had promised uh, Harrison an appointment as the head of the planned Pan-African University. This, however, is not to be, as Garvey soon found himself in serious legal trouble. The best of Harrison's uh, newspaper and magazine articles were published in two small books, The Negro and the Nation in 1917 and When Africa Awakes, published in 1927. Harrison's wit and erudition led him to encounter many intellectual luminaries of his era. His home, Harlem, was itself now aglow with the likes of intellects such as Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, Claude McKay, James Weldon Johnson, Arthur A. Schomburg, Marcus Garvey, and A. Philip Randolph. But Harrison's popularity was not limited to Harlem by any means. In 1913, Harrison formed a group called the Radical Forum, whose membership was, with the exception of Harrison, all white. He also regularly attended meetings of the Sunrise Club and occasionally delivered lectures to this group, which was formed in 1889 by Edwin C. Walker. Here, Harrison came into contact with H.L. Mencken, Theodore Dreiser, Haywood Brune, and, and similar stars from that period. It was at the Sunrise Club meeting that Harrison was what must have been one of the few times duped. This happened in 1905 when Harrison was only 22 years of age. He was selected because of his sharp, skeptical mind to head a committee to observe the performance of a magician and to ascertain whether any paranormal, paranormal forces were at work. When the, the magician was Joseph F. Wren, who he might term kind of like the uh, amazing Randy of his day. Wren, Wren was the president of the Metropolitan Psychical Society. The meeting location was changed to a large ballroom with an overflow crowd of 1,000 in attendance for this demonstration. After the performance, Harrison pronounced that Wren had indeed violated physical laws. The magician responded with amusement, you are wrong, Mr. Harrison. I'll admit that you are one of the most brilliant lawyers in New York City, but your work has never made you an expert in trickery. Well, after all, Harrison was only a humanist never claimed infallibility, and was not averse to changing his position on issues. Harrison eventually changed his views relative to the importance of class struggle and the unity, unity of the proletariat. As an ardent socialist, his, his slogan had been class first. However, be he became disillusioned with the socialists as he perceived an increasing amount of racism within their ranks as the movement grew and in some ways began to move toward mainstream values. As a socialist, he had been employed as a lecturer was deeply upset, upset to discover in 1917 that he was being paid less than his white counterparts. When he complained, he was informed that as a black man, he should just be grateful to have work. After that moment, Harrison was no longer a socialist, not a big S socialist at least. His motto shifted from class first to race first. Harrison defended this red atavistic slogan by saying that since whites, including socialists, habitually thought in terms of whites first, it was necessary for African Americans to adopt a symmetric view in order to protect their own interests. You really have to understand the pervasive and pernicious nature of racism in the USA to understand how an intelligent, enlightened man could be driven to such a view. But Harrison's writings include hundreds of pages describing racial injustice and the futility of trying to conduct oneself in an America without take, making race a primary consideration. For instance, many blacks who managed to achieve affluence were physically attacked economically ruined, or sometimes both. These attacks were directed not just at individuals, but sometimes toward entire communities, where African-American affluence rose to a challenge the white concepts of superiority that suffused even the most basic aspects of day-to-day -day life. As a matter of fact, I, I, uh, it's kind of hard to relate to some of this stuff, you know, here in, the, you know, in Seattle in 2005. I had 
a list of things. There's even, you know, kind of a Jim Crow etiquette, different ways which did circumscribe how black people and, and white people interacted. I mean, race became uh, something that was so important to black people, it was a little hard to imagine, but it was important to them because it was made to be important to them. Their racial identity really dominated uh, how they interacted with, uh, with the rest of the world. For instance, uh, if a black person rode in a car driven by a white person, the black person sat in the back seat or, or, or the back of a truck. White motorists had the right of way at all intersections. Uh, white, whites did not use courtesy titles of respect when referring to blacks, for example, Mr., Mrs., or Miss, Sir, or Ma'am. Instead, blacks were to be called by their first names. Blacks had to use courtesy titles when referring to whites and were not allowed to call them by their first names. Under no circumstances was a black male to offer a cigarette, to offer to light a cigarette for a white female because that gesture implied intimacy. Blacks, were not supposed, blacks and whites were not supposed to eat together. If they did eat together, through necessity, whites were to be served first and some sort of partition should be placed between them. Uh, blacks were not allowed to show public affection toward one another in public, especially kissing, because it offended whites. Hmm. That sounds kind of familiar, actually, <laughs> doesn't it? You know, some of the objections we hear over uh, behavior of gays nowadays. Hmm. But anyway, I, I just mentioned those to kind of put this all in a, a context, because you, you hear uh, Harrison say things like race first, and and you have to really appreciate what's what was going on at the time and the very fact that black people could never ignore their racial identity unfortunately <clears throat> yes I, as i was saying you have to really have to un understand the pervasive and pernicious nature of racism in the usa to appreciate how an, an intelligent enlightened man can be driven to such a view To Harrison trying to play the game of life in America without acknowledging and responding to the inescapable hostility that blacks faced was like bringing a knife to a gunfight. Histol historian Joel Augustus Rogers maintained that Harrison's most significant influence was his effect on other contemporary black leaders, most notably Marcus Garvey. Rogers was himself an atheist. One of my favorite quotes from, uh, from Rogers is, uh, is this, he says, the slogan of the Negro devotee is, take the world, but give me Jesus. And the white man strikes an eager bargain with him. According to Rogers, Garvey's dream of forming an autonomous black homeland on the mother continent was nurtured by Harrison's teachings concerning the pride in African heritage. Although Garvey apparently held similar views prior to his association with Harrison, the latter provided intellectual legitimacy to these feelings and a means of constructing a social, economic, and historic framework for his concepts of black nationalism. In addition to Marcus Garvey, Rogers reported that Harrison's ideas deeply influenced the messenger group, which attracted attention, of injust which attracted attention to the injustices suffered by blacks during World War I. The messenger group, which was largely inspired by two men, A. Philip Randolph, yet another African-American atheist, and Chandler Owen, was in some sense the archetype for later groups in both the peace and civil rights movements. In stressing economic oppression and the use of, social, uh, use of economic tools to achieve racial equality, it faced the opposition of the War Department. While mentioning those influenced by Harrison, one must also include J.A. Rogers himself. Harrison's influence on Rogers was perhaps his most significant contribution, since Rogers' work forms a large part of the basis for the re-examination of Africa's role in world history. This led in turn to what we now call Afrocentrism and multiculturalism. In addition to writing about Harrison in his book World's Great Men of Color, published in 1947, Rogers was a personal friend and student in the informal sense of Harrison, although they were the same age. No doubt Rogers influenced Harrison as well. In the 1920s, Rogers wrote a book, From Superman to Man, which attacked racial prejudices. Harrison reviewed the book from atop a stepladder on, Har on Harlem Street Corner and then sold 100 copies for a dollar apiece, a feat which amazed Rogers. Rogers later wrote books entitled Sex and Race, Nature Knows No Color, which were likely, quite likely influenced by his association with Harrison. 
Harrison had made a study of the importance of African culture to world progress. Rogers' work gave Harrison's concepts the full treatment they deserved. Rogers was also no doubt influenced by Carter G. Woodson, who was considered the father of Black History Month. But Harrison and Rogers shared the advantage of a totally humanistic approach to reconstructing black self-perception, which necessarily meant dismantling rather than adopting or adapting many religious concepts. Rogers pointed out to many for the first time that Africa had fostered high civilizations long before similar societies arose in Europe. The age of the earliest civilizations in, in other parts of the world was generally inversely related to their distance from Africa, offering yet more proof of Africa's influence. At a time when virtually the only concept of Africa and its inhabitants was couched in the exploitative Euro-American myths that only grudgingly, only grudgingly admitted humans, uh, blacks to the human race, Rogers not only, as Harrison had done before, demonstrated African equality, but also made a strong case for the cultural debt to Africa. Much of what, what today has thankfully developed into Afrocentrism and multiculturalism can be traced to the works of Rogers and his mentor, Hubert Henry Harrison. They were undoubtedly not the first to appreciate the greatness of African heritage, but their work placed the natural pride of African Americans in an intellectual context which the, world, which the rest of the world could not forever ignore. Why is Afrocentrism important? Afrocentrism is important because the truth is, is important, and the classical views of history did not represent the truth to many of us. I'm sure that we've all been victimized by the indoctrination we have received, and which typically minimized the role of women, ethnic minorities, or gays in our history. When I left grade school, notice I didn't say finished, I thought that Columbus had discovered America and that Henry Ford had invented the automobile. Of course, from a strictly European perspective, Columbus did discover America. But we aren't Europeans, and those weren't pot potted plants along the shore as he dropped anchor. To say in an American context that Columbus discovered America clearly discounts the people already living here. Of course, in the 21st century, this is or should be easy to appreciate. In the early part of the last century, however, history was dogmatic and propagandistic, and religion even more so. Oftentimes, it is difficult to tell the difference with many people taking religious myth as history. Not that this isn't still going on. Some years ago, a friend ordered a product called a Timeline of History, which according to the ad in the back of the science magazine he saw it in, purported to show the main historic events from earliest civil civilization to modern times presented in, in the form of a long chart. When it arrived, he was shocked to find that it started out with the Garden of Eden and included such notable historical events as the Great Flood and the Tower of Babel. Needless to say, he demanded a refund. Religious myths such as biblical accounts of the curse of Ham and the fate of the Canaanites have been cited as justification for slavery. Harrison and Rogers' atheism was strongly linked to their ability to identify and analyze false doctrines embedded throughout our culture, but form originally formalized in our history and religion. Regarding the curse of Ham, I might elaborate on the story in the Old Testament where Noah became drunk and passed out in his tent nude. One of his sons, Ham, in some way offended Noah by viewing his body or deriding him. It's a little unclear, like a lot of things in the Bible. Or some believe possibly even making sexual overtones. In any case, Noah cursed Ham to eternal slavery, uh, servitude, and in, in biblical fashion, this also applied to all his, dis all his sons, his, all his descendants, shall I say. Canaan was the oldest son of Ham and gave his name to his descendants, the Canaanites, who carried this curse of Ham. I guess they could have actually been called the Hamsters, but that name was already taken. Uh, anyway, Judeo-Christian folklore relates somehow the Canaanites to the Africans. Rogers has an interesting story to tell regarding the reaction of some West Africans to the missionary's explanation that Ham was the first black person. The Africans said, you're wrong. All men were originally black, but Cain killed Abel, and God, God shouted at him, frightening, frightening Cain so much that he turned white and his features shrunk up, making him the first white man. So, makes about as much sense as anything, I guess. The relationship between free thinkers and, and liberal views on race can be traced back at least to the decades preceding the Civil War. Some of the prominent abolitionists were free thinkers, and the pro-slavery faction tied, tried to exploit the hostility toward free thinkers to legitimize their pro-slavery position. 
The following quote characterized, uh, characterizing the Civil War is from James Henley Thornwell, a prominent pro-slavery Presbyterian clergyman. The parties in this conflict are not merely abolitionists and slaveholders. They are atheists, socialists, communists, red, red Republicans, Jacobins on the one side, and the friends of order and regulated freedom on the other. In one word, the world is uh, the battleground, Christianity and atheism the combatants, and the progress of humanity the stake. Now the funny thing is I originally came up with this quote uh, back in the pre-internet days, you know, like 1990 or so when I was doing some research in this area. And uh, now if you go on the internet and you uh, Google some, you know, a text stream from this quote, you'll come up with this same quote and you find it being used today, you know, on the sites of many uh, Civil War apologists. Uh, so, I mean, this whole mentality about uh, uh, atheism and anti-religion somehow being related to the liberty of humanity is, is still a viable concept in such certain circles. So, the odd part about it is, is religious people still reject certain progressive social contexts and even scientific conclusions because they identify them with non-belief. It's easy for us to talk about the past, citing the works of others who have had vision to see through the generations of, of deception, who have had the ability to overcome negative programming that, that even became part of our own cultural heritage, leading to self-doubt, self-denial, and ultimately self-hatred. Self but let's look at today. Have things really changed that much? Have Afro Afrocentrism and multiculturalism been surpassed by advancements in our understanding of diverse cultural heritages? I don't think so. We still have a long way to go in arriving at an equitable fit between the diversity of our society and the perspective from which we view and interpret the events of our past. An example of the current intolerance for diverse points of view and the linkage between religious dogma and racism was provided a few years ago when I was back in St. Louis by the reaction of some high school students to a lecturer who had proposed that Jesus was black. They promptly walked out of the lecture. The incident seemed rather absurd from a freethinker's perspective since arguing over the racial identity of a character who is at least in some dimensions mythical must approach the futility of debating the uh, angels on a pinhead. However, strong feelings of what we now term racial identity and hierarchy are associated with Jesus, Judeo-Christian religious mythology and in fact are a major theme of these beliefs. The same mentality that identifies Jesus as one race or another is also used to promote other expressions of racism. The existence of ultra-racist Christian identity movement, which makes a convoluted argument that Jesus was not even Semitic, but was in fact Nordic, is evidence of the importance to which some people ascribe to this issue. Harrison's and Rogers' attacks on Eurocentric bias were not only an assault on some of the most basic values of white society, but also on the unquestioned beliefs of many African Americans. Assimilation of blacks in the North American culture meant that they too had largely become racist in a manner in which, in a manner that mirrored the culture as a whole. Black identity was a large degree defined by white perceptions. So blacks came to value light complexion, straight hair, high thin noses, and thin lips, characteristics all at the opposite end of the spectrum from those of their white uh, West African ancestors. Perhaps see the ultimate expression in these sentiments in Michael Jackson's cosmetic and surgical transformation. Such ideas can only have originated as an ad adaptation of European standards. The psychological and social efforts, effects of such value system have been devastating. Rogers documented the history of racial attitudes which has developed along racist lines long before the importation of slaves to the New World, as it has been called and explained them in terms of the competition between Europeans and Africans, such as Moors and other dark people. For Spain, this conflict had reached a climax at the time of Columbus's voyage, 500, the 500th anniversary of, of which we celebrated just a, a, about a decade ago. So-called discovery of America was, and the continuing reevaluation of that episode serves as an ideal case study in the manipulation of history that Harrison and Rogers fought. This case is particularly suited to Harrison and Rogers' approach because it had such strong religious overtones. And both Harrison and Rogers recognized the contribution of religion to the history of that oppression. The religious factors are recognized by Christians today, actually, 
and should not it should not surprise us that evangelical Christians appear to be the most dogmatic in the defense of the European destruction of native cultures. I'll cite as an example uh, an article from Christianity Today about uh, 14 years ago, went back when uh, the uh, 500th anniversary of, of uh, the discovery of America was uh, something that was being celebrated, so by some at least. And they, they had an article about uh, defending actually Christ, uh, Columbus's motives for the exploitation of America. And here I quote, Columbus was motivated by a love for God and a desire to finance the rescue of the Holy Land from infidel hands. So they basically, you know, <laughs> defended the ripping off of the native people, the destruction of native culture by the fact that they were trying to rescue the Holy Land. Considering that this disturbing assertion, the author fittingly relates genocide of native people to the Israelite conquest of Canaan complete with the slaughter of innocent children and even animals. Both events were ordained by God. The author also claims that European contact was good for Indian culture because, quote, without the horse import imported from Europe, indigenous American art and religion would have never had time off from the survival activities to dream and develop. I remember thinking at the time I hadn't really read anything this asinine in a long while, which is saying a lot because I as a hobby for laughs, I peruse a fair quantity of Christian literature. To find this sort of ignorance in one of the most popular Christian magazines was deeply disturbing. Religion is a repository and an incubator for myth and folklore encompassing many aspects of tribal knowledge, true and false. History, on the other hand, should be a, high, should be a, a, a source of truth and a way to determine that. No history can really, t really retell everything that actually happened, and it's seldom practical to re to even retell this, which of those events which do happen. The process of selecting information to learn and uh, which information to learn and which to teach is what determines the perspective. Be it e e Eurocentric, Afrocentric, or whatever, the process is basically the same, although the results may vary significantly. Whatever the perspective, any history should provide a facet of the truth. Perhaps the most attractive thing about Afrocentrism is that it acknowledges the bias. What we call world history before was actually Eurocentric world history. Of course, if you are totally ignorant of the other perspectives, you may not really appreciate this distinction. Therefore, Afrocentrism, women's studies, gay studies, Native American studies, and all the other disciplines are valuable in establishing the context in which we view the world. Without these very perspectives, perhaps we could have never, some of us at least, have been able to synthesize a more humane evaluation of such historic phenom historical phenomena as uh, Columbus's voyage, the slave trade, and more recently Zionism and Christian and Islamic fin fundamentalism. Multiculturalism acknowledges the fact that we do share a heritage of many different groups. Harrison and Rogers never sought to establish the ascendancy of, Af of the African-American perspective. It was not promoted to de demonstrate African superiority although they did point out many instances of African leadership or influence. Just as there is an Afrocentric history, I'm afraid there's also an Afrocentric religion and myth and, and pseudoscience. The, the task of those who promote an Afrocentric position as equal to the dominant Eurocentric position has been made difficult, more difficult, by those who would exploit pent-up interest in things African and the tendency to read and the tendency to react to relate to uh, racism, in, racism in society by aggrandizing African, the African heritage. A number of honest and scholarly debates have actually developed about the merits of certain theories which have emerged from Afrocentrism, particularly centering around the definition of black or even African and the consequent identification of specific historic individuals or groups under these categories. Unfortunately, the fringe of Afrocentrism has given shelter to those who would, for instance, have ancient Egyptians gadding about in airplanes. I'm serious. <laughs> of course, the previous, previously mentioned debate over the racial identity of religious characters, particularly Adam and Eve and Jesus, is perennial. More dangerous, however, is the recent theory of African racial superiority based upon the supposed powers of the melanin pigment, which gives blacks their color, as well as protection against harmful the harmful penetration of ultraviolet rays. But a small but surprisingly influential groups of, of black pseudoscientists and writers have come to be called misleadingly melanin scholars. 
They've seized upon this conjecture to, pr to promote uh, various claims of black racial superiority, uh, one, one of the wildest being that melanin itself constitutes a tiny computer that somehow endows its owner with superior mental faculties. Norm Allen of the African American for Humanism, of African Americans for Humanism uh, wrote me some years ago to describe a melanin conference that he attended. These theories, if we can call them that, are often tied in with religious or New Age concepts and depend not at all on evidence for their acceptance, but rather a, a willingness or even a desire for the, uh, on, the half, on behalf of the audience, uh, an African-American uh, population that has been victimized by generations of psychological oppression spearheaded by religious indoctrination. This has all made them perhaps more susceptible to these sorts of ideas. Their acceptance of such hogwash to whatever degree can be attributed to several factors. First, the psychological damage caused by negative racial identity, which has caused some black people, perhaps more than whites, to seek things which are affirmative to their self-esteem. Secondly, the fact that African Americans tend to be more religious and less educated than the general population, which contributes, contributes to the uh, deficit in critical thinking skills. And finally, an excessive distrust of the much, of a much of generally accepted body of knowledge in the mainstream. And if you examine history, this is somewhat understandable. But in some individuals, this almost borders on paranoia. Fortunately, it was distressing that anyone would be willing to seriously consider the concept of melanin superiority. It's heartening that the number of blacks who have actually bought into it seems to be small, and the black press has remained thankfully skeptical. Well, anyway, it's too bad we don't have more Hubert Henry Harrisons around today. There's ample need for people who are talented enough and fearless enough to bring to, the, con to uh, the common woman and man an uncompromising challenge to the institutions and traditions of our society, as well as our own per personal beliefs and assumptions. These, people are, these are people who serve the truth and in doing so benefit us all. Hubert Henry Harrison died in, in 1927 at the age of only 44. At the time of his death, he had little in the way of material possessions. He also had little respect from the more conservative elements of the black community, although the Harlem Unitarian Church was for some time thereafter known as the Hubert Harrison Memorial Church. Two leading black magazines, The Crisis and Opportunity, ignored his death altogether. He was eulogized, however, in the New York Times in a back, uh, I'm sorry, he was utilized, eulogized in the Pittsburgh Courier, and I'm gonna just, uh, end by reading you that. This is from the Pittsburgh Courier. It was a better, it was a revelation to see Hubert Harrison mounted on the street corner, on a street corner ladder, and surrounded by a crowd of several hundred Negroes discussing philosophy, psychology, economics, literature, astronomy, or, or the drama, and holding his audience spellbound. His achievement should prove an inspiration to many young Negroes, for despite the handicap of poverty, he became one of the most learned men of his day and was able to teach the wide masses of his race how to appreciate and enjoy all the finer things of life. To glance back over the whole history of mankind and to look forward as far as thought can reach." In quotes. Thank you very much. You know, when I was thinking about uh, giving this presentation this morning, one of the things that came to mind for some reason, you know how those odd thoughts cross your mind, was I remembered uh, Jimmy Carter uh, develop, delivering a eulogy for uh, Hubert Humphrey. I think it was at uh, one of the Democratic conventions after Humphrey had died. And he uh, said, instead of saying uh, Hubert Humphrey, he said Hubert Horatio Hornblower. And that got stuck in my mind that I just said, I know at one point during this talk, I'm going to say Hubert Horatio Hornblower. I'm glad I, <laughs> I'm glad I didn't repeat uh, Jimmy Carter's performance. <laughs> Thank you very much.